always good to see that the webinar link worked. <laughs> Super. Okay, well, it's 10.01. I think we'll get started. Welcome, everyone. Um, welcome to this morning's webinar. Uh, we're going to present Alberta Ecotrust Foundation's Integrated Program Framework and Environmental Grant Program. My name is Lori Risling Wynn, and I'm a program specialist here at Alberta, Alberta Ecotrust Foundation. And also joining me is program specialist Diana Krapko, who's co lead with me on the Environmental Grant Program. We also have Rod Ruff. Alberta Ecotrust Vice President, Mike Melross is joining us, a Program Director, Jessica Lajewa and Stephanie Drozda, Program Specialists with our Climate Innovation Fund are here. And we also have Pat Letizia joining us, who is our President and Executive Director. So today's session will be recorded and posted on our website along with the slide deck. Please use the Q&A area to type in your questions and we'll either answer them on the fly or during the Q&A portion at the end. Live's transcription is enabled for the webinar, so if you'd like to access this, please click the CC at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And if you need technical assistance, please put that in the chat and our program team will be happy to help you. And we'll be together for about an hour this morning and during this time, Rod is gonna give you an, a high level over, overview of Alberta Ecotrust Foundation's refreshed strategy. And myself and Diana will introduce the environmental grant program, and then we'll have some time for some questions at the end, and hopefully that's good for everyone. So during these past two years that we've spent working remotely and gathering through our screens, it's more important now than ever to remember and acknowledge the land and traditional territories that we're working from. I'm joining you today from Canmore, which is Treaty 7 territory and several other Alberta Ecotrust team members are also joining from Treaty 7 in Calgary. And these are the traditional territories of the Siksika, the Pekani, the Kainai, the Sutina, and the Stony Nakoda First Nations, and also home to the Métis Nation of Alberta Region 3. And we also have staff joining us from Edmonton, which is Treaty 6 territory, and the traditional gathering place for diverse Indigenous peoples, including the Cree, the Blackfoot, the Nakoda Sioux, the Iroquois, the Dene, the Ojibwe, the Salto, the Anishinaabe, Inuit, and many others. And Edmonton is also home to the Métis Nation of Alberta Region 4. And as we collectively engage in this work to support healthy ecosystems for all, I invite you to consider how we can learn and honor the traditions of the people who were here before us and the people who may come after us. In order to foster collaboration this morning, we're, um, we're trying something a little different on a platform called Padlet. And Jessica is gonna share the link to the Padlet in, in the chat box. And so it's, it's basically a, a virtual board where you can post a business card of sorts. Um, and we're trying this out as a networking opportunity for you to connect with one another, to introduce your projects if you're looking for collaborations. Um, and hopefully it's a little bit more interactive than um, using the chat function in Zoom um, and a little bit more, uh, just a little bit more dynamic. So uh, when you get to the Padlet board, you'll see that there's a pink circle in the bottom right corner. You can click on that um, to add a post, putting in your organization name, your email, an idea for any project, and if you're open to the possibility of finding partners or collaborators. The Padlet board will be open during the webinar and we'll also send the link afterwards and it will remain open until July 20th. So that's it for me for now for logistics and now I'll pass it off to Rod. Thanks, Lori. Um, and as Lori mentioned, I'm going to give a brief overview of who Alberta Ecotrust is, how we operate, uh, our new and emerging program framework, and hopefully this will set the stage for understanding the updated environmental grant programs that we're also going to present on today. And this is actually probably the largest webinar we've ever hosted based on um, audience registration size. And, and looking at that list, there was lots of new names, but even for some of the groups and people who know us well, they still often have questions about our governance model, where we receive our funding and resources from. And I always think it's good to start at the beginning. So I'm going to start with who we are, and then dive into some of the details regarding our current focus areas and priorities that have come out of our ongoing updating of our program framework. And so 
For Alberta Ecotrust, we always like to start with our founding story of more than 30 years ago. And we were very much founded as a joint initiative between Alberta-based environmental organizations and corporations in Alberta, recognizing that at that time in 1990, um, there was a lot of con growing concern about environmental impacts in the province. And there was a growing awareness that there needed to be a place for industry and nonprofits to work together uh, and contribute towards um, you know, our shared environmental priorities and our shared value for the environment. And so uh, we have two kind of founding fathers that we always uh, we always bring up, which is Michael Robertson, who was with uh, Petro Canada, and Rob McIntosh, who was the founding um, executive director of the Pemin Institute. And they kind of had this idea of Alberta Ecotrust as a place to build trust uh, between the sectors in Alberta, but act as a trust fund uh, for environmental projects. And the environmental grant program uh, that many of you know and love came out of that kind of founding story. And we, Alberta Eco Trust in our history has raised money, uh, usually from the corporate sector in Alberta, and then dispersed that through a unique governance model that was built upon consensus decision making between all of our partners uh, to support environmental work. And over the years, though, uh, we've kind of slowly evolved our model to be less binary between corporations and environmental organizations and more towards this idea of a community trust. We have active partnerships uh, with different levels of government. Uh, we now raise resources from um, many places beyond just the corporate sector. That includes individual philanthropic donors, other levels of government. Um, and so, um, you know, this idea of eco-trust um, has kind of evolved, but we still try to remain true to our roots, which is this idea of trust-based decision-making, uh, community projects that are advancing our environmental priorities. And that's always where we start. And I would say that raising money for the community is the number one priority of our organization. We know it takes resources and people to advance this important work. And so as we have refreshed, uh, as Lori says, our program framework based upon community feedback and need, we've also hoped that um, we always focus on this idea of impact and our ability as a foundation to drive positive change in our province. And we hope that this new approach presented today will enable us to raise even more funding resources to support this work. And so with that, uh, maybe we can dive into the next slide here, please. I don't want to go into too much detail here um, because I believe most of you are here for what you'd see is the bottom of this pyramid, which is our current focus areas and priorities. Um, but I do think it's important to remember that number one, Alberta Eco Trust is a charitable organization. Like all charities, we are regulated by the Canada Revenue Agency. And we need to follow our charitable purpose, which is focused on protecting the environment for the benefit of the public in Alberta and working towards outcomes that protect landscapes, improve water quality and quantity and address climate change. So that's really, you know, our charitable mandate. But I think even more important than that is, you know, the who Ecotrust is and the way that we approach change or the issues that we're working on. Um, and that really comes from a matter of who we are. And that's to say, we believe in collaborative and cross sectoral approaches that build trust and co cooperation between industry, government and nonprofit organizations. Um, so we believe in our core that working in this manner is kind of fundamental to addressing the complexity of social societal challenges and advancing a sustainable future. Next slide. I think one of the major impetuses for us to update our program framework uh, was, of course, the development and launch of the Climate Innovation Fund. And for those of you that aren't aware, the Climate Innovation Fund is a $43 million endowment that Alberta Ecotrust received from the federal government in 2019 with the purpose of delivering programming in Calgary and Edmonton that is primarily focused on reducing urban greenhouse gas emissions. And, and the receipt of this fund and subsequent launch of programs really did increase our activity uh, on the ground and level of support in the community. Uh, but it also turbocharged a path we were on as a foundation in some of our more traditional legacy work uh, to shift to a more mission-led approach. Um, where we focus on broad collaboration between sectors around concrete and ambitious goals and based on a joint purpose. And so for our urban work, we are really partnering directly and actively with the municipal government, uh, but we are also far more deliberate in how we work with everyone together as an ecosystem, including in our grant portfolio. Uh, and this is an approach that we have tested actively over the last decade uh, in our environmental programs. We piloted collaborative grant streams, We've delivered social innovation labs that had an ecosystem approach. And I think it's something now that we're gonna to try to fully embody in all of our work. And I think it'll come through um, the webinar today as we dive into the details. Next slide. 
And the other thing I want to point out to um, everyone today is that, you know, I know we're all here to learn about our funding programs, specifically our environmental granting streams, but in the spirit of understanding who Alberta Ecotrust is and how we are trying to deploy this mission driven approach, I think it's important to think about our work uh, in terms of the whole tool kit, the whole toolkit that Alberta Ecotrust is deploying. So yes, of course we deliver grants and we have several funding streams right now, the environmental grant programs that you're here to learn about today but also we have a funding stream uh, for the climate innovation uh, fund, uh, which is again, those projects in Calgary and Edmonton focused on climate mitigation. Uh, we are currently reviewing a funding stream in Edmonton focused on climate um, research uh, that's supported by the city of Edmonton with the goal of relaunching that program next year. But in addition to grant making, we also have what we call foundation led initiatives. This is where Alberta Ecotrust uh, directly leads often um, in partnership and collaboration with multiple organizations and stakeholders uh, to on initiatives that educate, train, build capacity or advance solutions where we feel that we can work directly with um, community members to advance um, you know, different initiatives that align with their charitable purpose. And so uh, over the last few years, we've hosted, as I mentioned, social innovation labs around affordable housing and environmental sustainability or on water quality issues. Uh, right now we have emerging projects in Calgary Edmonton focused on alleviating energy poverty, uh, providing energy labels to every uh, single family residence within the city and also helping nonprofits um, reduce their energy bills uh, through novel technologies like carbon capture. In addition to our foundation led initiatives, we have uh, a couple other buckets of activity. Uh, so we are now trying to deploy that federal endowment in local direct impact investments in Calgary and Edmonton. Uh, this is a brand new program from our Ecotrust that just went public uh, last month um, where we could invest or finance projects that align with our mandate. And we also have what we call strategic engagement. And many of you will be familiar with the environmental gathering or uh, big engagement projects like the Alberta Narratives Project, where we're trying to support advocacy, convening or knowledge sharing uh, among the people that we're working with. And so we have a broad solutions toolkit that we're trying to work with. And we're often trying to look at how our grants work together in our kind of portfolio of action that we're delivering. Next slide. And I'd just like to say before we get into the, the details here about our current focus areas and, and funding uh, criteria that this is the result of a, a deep engagement process over the last six months. I'm very grateful to our entire team, especially Lori, who stewarded a thoughtful and engaging process over those six months to really understand community needs and how we can have a bigger impact. Uh, and Diana, our team has been working incessantly as well to develop a new internal evaluation system for understanding the impacts of our work, but to also embrace trust-based approaches <laughs> and hopefully uh, maybe discard some of the zombie practices that come <laughs> along with uh, philanthropy, grant making <laughs> and reporting and evaluation. And so we're excited to dive into that with you today. Of course, at the same time, I would say we did uh, develop a three-year strategic framework for the Climate Innovation Fund that guides our work in Calgary and Edmonton through a, a different engagement process. Again, we're trying to integrate this, that work with what we've done here today. And we, I'd say that this work is always ongoing and we're actually really lucky right now to have ongoing support uh, from two different um, set of actors. So we are actively working in an ongoing fashion with Mark Kabaj uh, to uh, keep to refining our evaluation system and look at how we can develop and um, I guess uh, extract, uh, understand the insights that are coming from our work and with the work with others. And we're also actively working with future ancestors who are doing, uh, I guess, an, an, an audit of Alberta Ecotrust governance um, and internal operations from an equity perspective. And so as we start to talk more about community benefits and equity and the impact of our work, I think we're at the very uh, still early days of how we can better incorporate this into our shared work. Next slide. Uh, yeah, so without uh, further ado, uh, you know, if you've looked at the guidelines that have been posted on our website, we have uh, three new focus areas that are guiding our work. And, and we'd like to see, think of them as interconnected priorities that really reflect what we've heard from you about where Alberta Ecotrust can and should play a role. Uh, and those being nature-based solutions um, and Indigenous-led conservation, uh, climate resilience and emissions reduction, and a circular economy. And each of these areas increase our focus on projects um, that focus on human well-being, but hopefully also address human well-being. And I would say that this new framework uh, represents a shift from this broad focus on environmental outcomes, of land, water, and climate to specific focus areas and priorities where we've identified challenge statements within our program framework. And so again, this is a shift from focus on just good projects to a mission-driven approach 
where we're looking at mutually reinforcing activities and contributing to larger change processes within these focus areas. And so I think simply put, you know, this is about working toward that future world where nature is abundant and thriving. Human communities are both low carbon and resilient to a changing climate. And the economy is driven by principles of circularity as this kind of glue which drives positive interactions between nature and humans. And of course, we recognize that this overarching or foundational space in the middle represents work that could take place in all these spheres. And much of our environmental or community work is cross cutting across many domains. Um, you can just click through one more time, please. Um, so within each of these focus areas, you know, we formulated challenge statements which reflect the priority areas for the work in the next one to three years. Lori is going to take you through those shortly as they're going to form the basis for environmental grant making in this calendar year. But in building these challenge statements, we were really following the lights where we feel the energy is, where the landscape is moving, and where our charitable purposes um, give us the, 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 the direction to go, given that we have limited time and resources to kind of make progress. And we're hoping that this can help focus our work on practical solutions, focus our work on possibilities, um, and focus on this work and what we're doing together. Uh, we hope that they don't presuppose the answer, uh, that they don't kind of lay out solutions, but uh, leave it open to multiple solution pathways. And I think this is our reflective, uh, this is reflective of our understanding of the future and navigating uncertainty on our way to a low carbon future. And I'm going to close uh, off with the next slide, which is just talking about what we're calling the program framework lenses. And these are uh, things that came up again and again during our engagement um, during the last six months, but also um, in recent times and as we've engaged with um, all of our stakeholders uh, and the signaling that this is uh, things that are very important to the community right now and they're very important to us. And so we've been trying to evaluate all of our programmatic offerings um, using these perspectives over the last several years. And we recognize that not all initiatives incorporate every single one of these lenses. Uh, but rather, it's important to take a portfolio approach where different interventions um, have stronger outcomes in different areas. Uh, and, you know, within these lenses, the three that I'm going to talk about today. So when we talk about Indigenous voices and equity, uh, we're looking at projects designed to promote equitable outcomes as a part of their design. Uh, this could be projects that are Indigenous led or including Indigenous participation um, in different ways or uh, looking at including more diverse voices. Uh, from equity deserving groups who are typically excluded um, from environmental initiatives. Uh, or is the project specifically trying to address some kind of social inequity or systemic barrier um, as part of its intervention pathway? And when we talk about scale and systems change, we're really talking about the potential for accelerated or exp exponential change beyond the project's direct scope through a clear strategy designed to address barriers and drivers for scale or points of leverage and scale up that will enable such changes. Uh, and uh, some examples of this would be amplifying voices or shifting public narratives, unlocking culture change around environmental initiatives, or exploring innovative initiatives um, that the intersection of ecological, economic well-being and social equity, building dialogue to reduce social polarity, uh, or working with uh, diverse sets of partners across sectoral collaborations to bring multiple perspectives and areas of society around complex challenges, and of course, uh, advocating and supporting the development of public policy and policy instruments through the building of public supports or either through partnership with institutions. And the last kind of lens that we're looking at is community benefits and recognizing that a healthy environment is one part of a healthy human society and looking at the bigger picture of what's really important to people. And this means that we're looking for projects that can create multiple benefits uh, through their interventions and supporting integrated approaches that look at ecological benefits in tandem with human needs. And I think we believe this can really widen the circle of people who show up and use their expertise, voices, and passions in this work every day. So that's the high level overview uh, of the program framework and where EcoTrust is going. I think it's still very much emergent. We're still kind of at the, the launch pad of this. And at EcoTrust, we're always um, you know, we're willing to relook at what we're doing and why. Um, and we're hoping that you'll come with us on this journey as we learn uh, in, in delivering this new approach. With that, I'll hand it back to Lori. Thanks so much, Rod, for that overview and that great introduction um, and giving that grounding and context to the work um, and how much, of it, how much of it has informed the design of the environmental grant program. Um, so with that, I'm gonna shift into talking specifically about the environmental grant program and our offerings for 2022 and beyond. 
And I'll also note at this point that all of this information is on our website and is in the program guidelines that are um, that are that are also linked on on the environmental grants page on the program on the website. So using the engagement we've done over the past year to inform our work, we're excited to introduce uh, the environmental grant program and what we're calling our environmental impact grant and our springboard grant. And I'll dive further in subsequent slides, but here are the high level details, starting with the environmental impact grant. This grant will be grounded in the focus areas that Rod mentioned, um, and it will be um, important to understand that the focus areas and challenge statements are really where, where the work um, should be drawing from. And the time frame, time frame to complete these initiatives will be 24 months. And the initiatives can request up to $50,000 or $100,000 for high impact projects. This grant will have a two-step application process and expression of interest followed by full application for select projects. And for 2022, the EOI intake will open on June the 20th and close on July 22nd. For 2023 and beyond, EOIs will open in December and close mid-January, and this will allow for planning earlier in the year and to align with the federal fiscal calendar, which many applicants indicated to us was important. We'll also have a second grant stream, which we're calling our springboard grant. And this grant is meant to specifically support capacity building activities also related to the focus areas and challenge statements. These funds are meant to help springboard your organization or initiative towards success, hence the name. And unlike our community grant stream, this stream is not generally intended to be project-based, but rather a grant that assists your organization in supporting a full-time staff person or to provide training or other support that creates capacity for your organization to achieve the work that you're doing within the focus areas. The time frame on this grant will be one year and the maximum amount, amount will be $10,000. This will be a simpler one-step process of an application only and there will be both a spring and a fall intake for this grant. And I'm gonna spend the remainder of our time here this morning focusing on the environmental impact grant because it is launching on June 20th but these are also the basics of the springboard grant and the focus areas, the challenge statements and the selection criteria for both grant streams will be the same. So what kind of projects will be supported by the environmental impact grant? Well, initiatives must of course, focus on a focus area, a focus area and challenge statement and also include the additional community benefits that Rod spoke to and this is in line with our multi-solving approach where a project can solve various problems and simultaneously achieve multiple benefits within a single initiative. Initiatives must also demonstrate a clear pathway to scale up. So con consider the potential for accelerated or exponential change beyond the scope of your project's direct work. I'm gonna take a few, few minutes now to talk about the challenge statements associated with each of the focus areas and framing priorities as challenge statements might be new language for people. Um, so I'll just chat about that for a little bit. So challenge statements are intended to be calls to action and they signal our priorities for the next one to three years. A challenge statement is a description of a problem in a way that you're able to solve for it. It speaks to urgency. It is a call to action for others to be involved and inspires hope for change. It can connect with the problem frame in order to be able to solve for it. And given that we always have limited time and resources to make progress, challenge statements will help us focus on practical solutions, focus on possibilities, and it says that we're in this work together. Challenge statements, as Rod mentioned, don't presuppose the answer. They don't say the kind of solution, but leave it open to multiple solution pathways. So within that context, each of our focus areas have challenge statements associated with them. And there are three challenge statements associated with the focus areas of nature-based solutions and conservation. So these are initiatives that deploy nature-based solutions for the purposes of measurable and attributable carbon sequestration and ecosystem services, initiatives that advance community-led climate, water quality or water conservation and biodiversity solutions that protect key ecosystems 
and initiatives that improve understanding of agriculture's role in nature-based solutions and decarbonization pathways. And we thought it would be helpful if we provided a few examples of the types of initiatives that could be proposed for some of the challenge stations, challenge statements to help you understand the types of initiatives you might consider. So under the first challenge statement here, an example of this could be calculating emissions factors for various land units to inform land use planning. So as areas are developed, there's often a loss of carbon sinks. However, decision makers are rarely accurately informed of the loss of the carbon sequestration or ecological services associated with the loss. So grantees could access funding to quantify ecological services and the loss of carbon sequestration potential associated with the development of land. And this information could be used for advocacy, for protecting these lands or to inform future restoration efforts or support, or support other nature-based solutions. The focus area of climate resilience and emissions reductions has two challenge statements. Initiatives that advance emission reduction strategies that can be attributed to municipal or community greenhouse gas emissions, including nature-based solutions and initiatives that advance low carbon resilience. So this is resulting in emission reductions while also adapting to climate change and improving community resilience. An example that fits for both of these challenge statements could be community scaling of green roof initiatives. So grantees could work to establish locally re relevant design standards for green roofs on public buildings, school buildings, or the like as demonstration projects. The initiative could quantify ecosystem services associated with the green roofs and create momentum for green roofs through education, advocacy, and celebrations of excellence. The initiative could even focus on areas within communities that suffer from environmental racism. This example includes direct action on the climate, climate or sorry, on the challenge statement itself. And it also demonstrates scale and it could even be centered around addressing important issues of equity. It could also achieve climate adaptation goals by improving stormwater management and modifying temperatures. The focus area of circular economy has two challenge statements, initiatives that enhance the knowledge, understanding, or ability for communities to engage in circular economy examples, and initiatives that accelerate the transition to a circular economy. And we heard a lot uh, during our refreshing engagement about the need for initiatives that challenge our current economic systems and also integrate the concepts of circularity. So this focus area is an opportunity to actualize that work and can be made tangible through circular economic initiatives. A good example of the second challenge, challenge statement is the development of local food charters or food policies for communities. So food charters can address local procurement they can help develop logistics for distributing surplus food and valorize discarded organic material. Food charters can help communities make the most out of their food resources while supporting regenerative natural systems. They can also help reduce greenhouse gas emissions, improve community resilience, address poverty and inequity, and possibly even center the work around Indigenous food sovereignty. Communities can be the drivers of change in our food systems, which is an example of a circular economy initiative. And the final focus area is, is what we're calling overarching or foundational. And the challenges in this, uh, sorry, the challenge statements in this area are meant to address either nature-based solutions and conservation, climate resilience and emissions reduction, or circular economy, and also center the initiatives around justice, equity, monitoring, or financially focused work. And so to provide an example, um, we'd like to look at an initiative that's um, exploring financing for nature-based solutions and how we might advance something like a conservation impact bond here in Alberta. And the example I wanna highlight is the Dashcan ZB Conservation Impact Bond, which is an innovative made in Canada mechanism that brings together indigenous conservation and investment leadership to deliver real impact. And Jessica has shared the story map um, of this project in the chat, and it will really help to bring the, the project to life and also ground you to where the work is being done. So the Conservation Impact Bond is an outcomes-based financial instrument focused on reconciling people and ecosystems by building capacity around healthy landscapes, 
with Indigenous leadership and nature smart solutions. One of the first of its kind in the world, this financing model was conceived to mobilize and increase capital towards reversing the trend of habitat loss and accelerating growth and long-term stewardship of healthy landscapes. Both groups and individuals can invest for monetary returns on environmental gains. And developed and launched in 2020 by the Dashcan ZB Conservation Impact Bond Leadership Team, and this consists of the Chippewas of the Thames First Nation, Verge Capital, Thames Talbot Land Trust, the Ivy School of Business at Western University, and the Carolin Carolinian Canada Coalition, with the support from 3M. Phase one is the first steps towards the goal of improving 400 hectares or 1,000 acres of Ontario's Carolinian forest zone, which is the most complex and fragile ecoregion in Canada and home to many Indigenous nations and some of the country's most diverse flora and fauna, and also home to approximately 25% of Canada's population. So the Bond Centre's Indigenous Leadership and Conservation, it brings that leadership to the fore and integrates Indigenous ways of knowing. The project represents innovative collaboration. The partners include public and private finance, academia, nonprofit and Indigenous communities, and represents a path towards Indigenous reconciliation. And so we hope that in sharing examples with you that will bring to life the type of projects that might be pursued under the focus areas and challenge statements, and that you too are inspired by what might be accomplished in the future through our environmental grant program. So I'm gonna shift now to how projects will be assessed and the application scorecard elements. So the first lens we'll be looking at for assessing applications will be whether or not the project is in alignment with the challenge statements uh, and our focus areas. The additional lenses, and, and Rod spoke to these briefly as well, those of Indigenous voices and equity, community benefits, systems change and scale. Lori, yeah. Can I break in for one second? Because yeah. it's coming up so often. I think yeah. we should talk about geography. Um, okay. That, uh, you know, this is within Alberta, but it's not, uh, it's not limited to the two large cities, Edmonton and Calgary. This is Alberta wide. That's right. um, and I, we just had frequent uh, questions regarding that. So. Yeah, thanks, Mike, for bringing that up. Um, yes, so as with our previous environmental grant programs, um, applicants um, from all across the province of Alberta are welcome to apply, um, including opportunities within um, Calgary and Edmonton as well that aren't necessarily. Um, so the Calgary, um, or sorry, the Climate Innovation Fund is really focused on emissions reductions. But there's a, you know, there's a wide spectrum of projects that could also be contemplated in Calgary and Edmonton. Um, as well, but more, more generally, you know, the, the environmental grant programs are indeed open to uh, organizations all across the province of Alberta. Um, so getting back to the lenses, so um, again, Rod briefly introduced them, but here uh, again, Indigenous voices and in equity, community benefits, systems change and scale potential. Um, and as mentioned, these also emerged out of our engagement and we've used these to inform not just the design of the grant program, but the selection criteria we will use to determine projects. And they'll also inform our evaluation and learning. And these lenses came up again and again during our engagement. And with the signaling, it was clear to us that these things are important to you. And so they're important um, to us as well. And we'll really bring and add value to the work. And so while not all initiatives will incorporate all of these things, Again, it could be like a portfolio approach where you could include relevant aspects um, of the lenses into your work and an exceptional project may very well incorporate all of them. And as part of scale, we'll be looking for collaborations and partnerships and we'll be looking for modest high level, high level partner assembly at the EOI stage. At the full application stage, we'll be looking to see that partners are committed at a high level and then deeper confirmation of of partnering if your project is approved. And we're still finalizing the details on the application scorecard and it will be available on our website in the coming weeks and certainly when the application portal opens on June the 20th. So who's eligible to apply? Registered charitable organizations and other qualified Canadian donees, um, nonprofit organizations and organizations of indigenous communities across Alberta. 
and municipalities, the government of Alberta, provincial agencies, academia, for-profit and private sector entities are eligible to apply, provided they partner with a charitable and or nonprofit organization who acts as the lead proponent for the project. And as mentioned, the funding amount for this grant will be $50,000 with a 20% matching requirement. And that 20% matching can be cash or in kind, can come from multiple sources, and non-cash contributions such as salaries can be used for the matching funds provided they're an auditable, auditable expense. And we'll also consider funding up to $100,000 for higher impact projects. And by high impact, we mean projects that include multiple groups and equal partnership, and that they be exemplar initiatives with the potential for greater impact and include rich learning opportunities and outcomes. Groups in collaboration on these types of projects would all contribute to the outcomes, and they don't have to share or disperse the funds equally, but must work together. So the grant portal will open for expression of interest on June the 20th until July 22nd, so open for a month. The EOI will be fairly light touch and will ask you to provide basic project details and a narrative, including the total budget, the amount of funds requested, and describe how your initiative will align with the focus area and challenge statements and our evaluation criteria. And at full application, you'll be asked to provide detailed project description and plan and full budget. And how will the decisions be made? So at the EOI stage, Alberta Ecotrust staff will screen the EOIs for alignment um, and incorporation of the application scorecard elements. And once we get to the full application stage, applications will be reviewed and approved by our environmental grant committee. And Rod spoke to um, you know, the history of Alberta Ecotrust and our partnerships with environmental non nonprofit groups and organizations and industry. And so the Environmental Grant Review Committee is also made up of representatives of both our industry partners and the ENGO community, so a representation of your peers and colleagues. Alberta Ecotrust Foundation has been using this model for decision making throughout our history, and this, this unique approach highlights the collaborative nature of our work. So how can you put together a strong application? Uh, well, we would advise that you start by reviewing our resources, which are available on the website. You can also look to past projects for inspiration. There's lots of great case studies on the website as well. Please review the focus areas and the challenge statements and the application scorecard and ensure your expression of interest addresses these. And you can also book a call with myself or Diana to discuss your, to discuss your proposed initiative. And we've set up an appointment schedule through Calendly. Um, which you can access again from our website. And so with that, I'm going to pass it over to Diana, who's gonna finish up by sharing our approach to um, reporting and evaluation. Thanks, Lori. Next slide, please. So through the last few iterations of the environmental grant programs, we've received amazing information from our grantees, some really inspirational stories. But as always, we wanna improve our grant processes, we want to be able to add value to you, to all of our stakeholders and grantees. So we're going to evolve our data collection process to be more applicable to the scale and objectives of the projects that you'll be completing. As such, we're going to be implementing three shifts in our approach to monitoring, evaluation, reporting, and learning. Shift one is the movement towards emphasizing learning and adaptation over standardized reporting. Shift two looks at adjusting reporting requirements to fit the scope of the project. And shift three is where we will utilize multiple methods of evaluation to create value for our grantees, partners, stakeholders, and ourselves as well. And just to be clear, the intent of this process is to continually adapt. There's not gonna be a perfect final version just like your cell phone's operating system, we're gonna to continue to monitor for bugs, pinch points, uh, potential improvements, and we're always gonna be looking for feedback. And so we will be updating this process as we, as we proceed through it. Now we'll get into these three shifts in a little bit more detail. Next slide. So shift one, the movement towards emphasizing learning and adaptation over standardized reporting. 
As a granting organization, we are required to account for the funding we allocate and the outcomes associated with that funding. We will continually monitor our grant programs to ensure that they are functioning effectively and to identify any issues in the process. The targeted reporting point number one here identifies that we will still require minimal reporting from all grantees to meet our account accountability obligations. The remaining points demonstrate this first shift towards the strategic, strategic learning. And just to note here that these activities listed here have all been done in the past by Ecotrust. However, this is kind of the first time for us that they've been formally integrated into our grant process. Cross-initiative learning is where we will review all of our funded projects and initiatives, looking for similarities and patterns that might benefit from a deeper dive. We will work to connect the dots between different initiatives to hopefully create a more robust view and understanding of a particular topic. A scan of innovative topics associated with focus areas is intended to uncover new opportunities and identify barriers to progress. Shared sense-making sessions will bring together stakeholders to discuss results, opportunities, barriers, and potential solutions or implications to the work completed. And that brings us to the last point on this shift. So as you've seen, our team has a real commitment to improvement and adaptation. We're not gonna get everything right this year and we can't prioritize the wants and needs of every single one of our stakeholders, but we always are looking for your honest feedback and we always are going to try to make things better. Next slide. Shift two looks at adjusting reporting requirements to fit the scope of the project. This is where we will see how this will directly affect you as a potential grantee, as there's going to be three different types of evaluation. So most of the projects funded under the springboard grants will likely fall under the level one type of grant reporting. These are initiatives with a smaller scope and fixed straightforward objectives. They will be required to submit the basic accountability reporting, including financials and relevant key performance indicators. But we're always going to make space for you to tell us about anything new or exciting or unexpected that came out of your project. Initiatives placed under the level two evaluation and reporting will have a broader scope and be expected to have significantly higher contribution associated with their challenge statement. The same reporting as level one will be required, of course, um, the accountability reporting, as well as additional key performance indicators, and likely more interaction with the program staff. You can expect that initiatives funded through the Environmental Impact Program will fall into this level of reporting. And level three evaluation will encompass initiatives that are high impact and have the potential to provide significant progress towards outcomes and learnings for the foundation, grantees, and stakeholders. The level one accountability reporting obviously will be required as well as additional KPIs in order to bring it up to that level three of evaluation. Willing grantees with exemplary initiatives may be offered the opportunity to partner with us to utilize additional resources in order to enhance the breadth of knowledge for that particular area and to extend the information to a wider audience. Next slide. And shift three is where we will adjust how our funded initiatives are evaluated in order to create more value. The most basic method referenced here as the min spec indicators will provide us with the data needed for standard dashboard metrics, number of projects completed under a certain focus area or in a certain location, amount of dollars allocated to specific priorities, details like that. Much of that data can be easily compiled without requesting additional information from grantees. However, there will be a few indicators that are included in all final reporting, an example being number of individuals directly impacted by a project. In the next method, impact and learning case studies, we will take a closer look at some of the completed projects by utilizing both quantitative and qualitative data obtained from the final reports and other data sources. This is likely where you'll find program staff contacting you directly about some of the aspects of your project not captured in the final report to create some of these case settings, case studies. And the final method of evaluation is a portfolio review. This is where we will evaluate a cluster 
of similar mutually reinforcing initiatives to gain a deeper understanding of the impacts, opportunities, and barriers of that portfolio. Next slide. So now I'm going to introduce you to the new quarterly reporting process, which understandably may feel like a bit of a step backwards after the last few slides where we were talking about reducing the reporting burden. However, there is a very important reason we're bringing this forward now. So as Lori mentioned earlier, we are now able to provide funding directly to nonprofit groups instead of requiring them to partner with a charitable organization. This is great news because it's been requested by a lot of you and uh, it really opens up our eligibility and allows a, a number of different organizations to access our funding. There is, however, a trade-off. Um, CRA regulations do require evidence of greater involvement and interaction by the foundation with projects that are funded through a program that encompasses both charities and not-for-profit organizations. As such, we're moving the Environmental Impact Grant Program to a quarterly reporting schedule, similar to the reporting schedule currently in place for the Climate Innovation Fund program. We are doing our best to keep this reporting light touch and hopefully make it a useful avenue for grant grantees to contact us regularly on any concerns, issues, questions, as well as an opportunity to tell us about early successes or just something that you're excited to share. The example on the screen is the information requested through the Climate Innovation Fund program. And I expect that this environmental impact grant will follow a similar format. If you're familiar with the old major projects program, just note that this quarterly reporting process will replace the interim reports for the environmental impact program. And the final reports will be the more targeted approach that we've gone over in the last few slides. Our team will meet after all of these quarterly reports have been submitted. So every quarter we'll meet to discuss the highlights or any issues or concerns that are brought forward by the grantees and also identify possible collaborations between initiatives or any new opportunities for more project communications. Next slide. Okay, so just to give you an idea, because there was a few questions in the chat about timelines. So if you, might, do you want to just click through a few times? Yeah, there we go. Good. So this is a schedule of all of our grant programs and the intake periods. Currently, the Climate Innovation Fund is underway. The expressions of interest have all been submitted in the screen, and the full applications will be complete shortly. In this year, or ongoing, there is going to be only one intake per year for the Environmental Impact Program. In 2022, the program will open, as Lori mentioned, for expressions of interest on June 20th. Going forward, the regular Environmental Impact Program intake will open mid-December and stay open until the third or fourth week of January. The Springboard Grant will have two intakes per year, as seen here in March and October of every year. So these are the general timelines of all of our grant programs. The specific dates will be announced a little bit closer to the deadline um, on the website. And with that, Lori, I will pass it off to you. Great, thanks so much, Diana. Um, so we're gonna move into the Q&A portion of the session this morning. So with that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and invite both Diana and Mike to join me. Um, to take any questions um, that have come up during the chat or any additional questions that people want to raise now. All right. Um, I think there's been a few questions around uh, this one. Um, so I thought it would be good to just bring it to the group as uh, in its entirety. Um, if you have a current grant uh, with Alberta EcoTrust, um, can you still apply for this grant this year? Yes, yes, absolutely. If you have a new project or initiative that you want to bring forward um, based on the focus areas and challenge statements that we've gone over and, and shared with you, um, you're more than um, we're more than happy to to see additional proposals come from forward from your organization. Okay, thanks. The next one that's come up a lot too is can you have multiple 
expressions of interest and how does that uh, that particularly work? Right, yeah, thanks for that question, Mike. Um, so this is in the program guidelines as well. So organizations are um, welcome to submit more than one EOI um, uh, as, part of, as part of your submission. However, it's probably likely that only one project from an organization would be advanced. And part of the reason for that is that we fully expect this, um, both of these streams to be oversubscribed and quite competitive. And so in the interests of you know, trying to be fair and equitable, um, we'd be happy to review multiple proposals from organizations, but again, it's probably likely that only one, one organization, or sorry, one proposal per organization would be advanced to full application. And um, there's been some questions around uh, the roles of municipalities and how they will uh, be part of this grant. Um, and also, like, are they the community or is um, the greater community the definition of community? So how, first off, as a municipality, how, how, are, how do we treat them in our grant program? Yeah, so uh, I think I mentioned this in one of the earlier slides that municipalities or the province of Alberta or provincial agencies could, um, could participate, but you, you do need to have uh, a chari charitable organization or a nonprofit organization being the lead proponent. So those, those organizations, those municipalities and, and provincial organizations do have to partner with uh, an ENGO or a charity in order to be able to apply. So there needs to be a really strong collaboration between both, um, both organizations. And I would say with regards to the definition of community, um, you know, it, it, again, if, uh, if, a, if one of the cities or a smaller community wanted, um, so capital C community wanted to make a proposal, they again would have to partner um, with an ENGO or a charitable organization. Um, and, you know, there's, there's lots of opportunities for community associations and smaller groups that represent community within, with, within the areas that we live. And we've certainly funded many of those organizations in the past. And so, um, you know, we would look forward to having uh, proposals being uh, put forward by, by those types of groups again in the future. So hopefully that answers the question. I don't know if you want to add anything to that, Mike. No, I, I think that makes sense. And I think it's project specific too. You know, the municipality can't be the lead applicant, but as a partnership, I, I certainly do see this on the circular economy side. Uh, absolutely. Usually municipalities take a strong role in that. So um, I think that um, uh, it definitely uh, warrants a call to Lori and Diana to kind of discuss the specifics of the grant. Um, there was a bit of confusion, I think you can clarify it right away, but um, another intake of the environmental impact grant is December 2022, correct? Yes, so um, there is going to be quite a flurry of activity around the environmental impact grant this year, so we'll have the, the first round, um, which again starts in June. Um, so pretty shortly here. Um, but then in order to get us into that cadence of having um, projects being proposed and, um, and selected and that process being finalized early enough in, in the year for organizations to do things like field work that I know many of you are, are doing, um, we are having to kind of cluster the intakes for this year only. And so for, for this year, at the end of this year in December, we will open for expression of interests again for the environmental impact grant and close it in mid-January to, to get us into that cycle where we're, um, we're doing the intake earlier in the year. And from that point forward, that's when the intake will be. Okay. And what about the fund overall funding envelope? So how much uh, funding do we have each year for the environmental impact grant and then for the springboard grant? Now, knowing, of course, everyone should know that we do actually um, seek out funding each year. And uh, in general, this would just be uh, an indication of the amount of funding that we have. Yeah, so the, fund, the full funding envelope for the environmental impact grant is $500,000 and the full funding envelope for the springboard grant is $100,000.
Sorry, I've got some noise in the background. Hopefully, people can hear that. <laughs> um, let me just uh, go to this. So uh, I know it, the timeline uh, was um, shown, but someone's asking about interviews. That was a big part of the process for Alberta Ecotrust grants in the past. Um, how how are we treating that this this time around? So at the expression of interest stage, we won't be doing any interviews, but again, we strongly encourage applicants to, to make an appointment with either Diana or myself to talk about your initiative. Um, and then once uh, expressions of interest get screened and projects that get selected for full application, it's one of the things that we are considering um, as part of the full application process, but it would more than likely be kind of on, um, by request by the applicant. So uh, we aren't doing uh, required interviews as part of the full application process, but we would consider having an interview uh, to support to support organizations to be able to to make their full application submission. But again, it would likely be on a case by case basis and we'd want to have a conversation with applicants about that um, to, to surface those opportunities. There is a question about um, the estimated number of grants that we get in on an annual basis. Um, now, of course, we can't really forecast that going forward every year, but Rod, perhaps maybe you could just mention how many in the past have we typically received? Sure, I would say in the past, in a given year, we would usually receive 25 to 35 applications for a major project, which was the precursor to the environmental impact grant, and we would fund 12 to 15. Now, because we are increasing the disbursement uh, size, uh, I would expect that we would fund around 10, 10 environmental impact grants. And, and so that would be about a third of what I would anticipate the annual um, ask to be. Okay. Um, public schools, Lori, are they uh, an eligible applicant? Um, yes, they are. And so again, there is some guidance around education initiatives in the program guidelines. So I'd certainly encourage people to, um, to look at that. We are, um, again, sort of looking back at the lenses and the, and the things that we're, we're hoping to see um, surface with applications. Um, and in particular around education, we would really like to see those scale elements um, demonstrated and also some of the co-benefits. So, um, so I would really encourage folks who are contemplating those types of activities to really think about how you can bring some of the other elements of, um, of the lenses that we've identified to support the focus areas and challenge statements. Can you maybe just describe the difference between the springboard grant and the major, uh, and the environmental impact grant again? And can you apply for both in one year? I'm going to let Diana jump in and, and maybe answer this one actually to give her some airtime as well. Okay, sorry. Well, the springboard grant, um, aside from the timelines, is is meant to be that uh, smaller scope, but really targeted towards bringing the capacity of your organization to a new level. Um, so bringing in training, um, if you want to access, uh, let's say you wanted to access circular economy in the environmental impacts grant next year, but you need training, you need to learn about it, and you need to learn about how that affects your community. So training like that would certainly apply. Um, if you need seasonal staff to do some monitoring work, that's, that's also an eligible project. Um, but really, we're looking at whatever type of capacity building your organization needs, as long as it aligns with the challenge statements, um, they will be considered. This is a new area for us this year, so we're a little excited <laughs> to see what kind of stuff you guys come up with. It's going to be pretty, uh, pretty competitive as well, I have a feeling, because a lot of groups have contacted us regarding capacity, it, it came up time and time again in all of our stakeholder engagements. So um, it's gonna be probably a good mixture of all different types of capacity building, training, education, hiring. Um, yeah. Okay, thanks Diana. Um, sort of variations of this um, 
have uh, have come up on the capacity side. So I think if you have any specific questions um, about your particular grant, it's really great, I think, to book a call with Lori or Diana, because there were a few questions that were like that that were coming up in the Q&A about the specifics of your project idea. Um, and I think it would be uh, better um, suited to a uh, individual conversation with the program specialists. Um, I think that's all the time we have for questions. So I'll hand it back to you, Laurie, to, to close us off. Sweet, thanks. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, Diana. Um, yeah, so on behalf of Alberta Ecotrust Foundation, I'd really like to thank you all for your attendance this morning and your interest in our environmental grant program. Please again, feel free to use the Padlet board for your project business cards. And we of course encourage you to reach out to either Diana or myself with questions or to discuss your project. We'll be sending out a post survey or post session survey um, along with a recording of the session and a copy of today's slides and posting both of those on the website as well. Um, and we'd really appreciate hearing from you what you thought about today's session. And with that, we'll close the webinar and wish all of you a great rest of your day, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us.